My country owes me no debt. It gave me, as it gives every boy and girl, a chance. It gave me schooling, independence of action, opportunity for service and honor. In no other land could a boy from a country village, without inheritance or influential friends, look forward with unbounded hope. My whole life has taught me what America means. I am indebted to my country beyond any human power to repay. Herbert Hoover rose from obscurity to become a dominant figure during the most pivotal periods of American history. His unique traits allowed him to triumph in fields private and public, social and political, but these unique traits also contributed to his tragic downfall. Nine years after the end of the Civil War, on August 10, 1874, Herbert Clark Hoover was born in the Quaker community of West Branch, Iowa. Orphaned by the age of ten, he was sent to live with his Quaker uncle in Newburgh, Oregon. A member of the pioneering class at Stanford University, he graduated in 1895 with a degree in geology. Hoover made his fortune building, operating, and inspecting mines in the United States, Australia, and China. Hoover's Quaker beliefs made him anxious to help others. In 1914, when the Great War started, Hoover was in London, preparing for his trip back to California. The besieged staff of the American Embassy requested his assistance in organizing the return of American citizens in Europe to the United States. Hoover created the American Citizens Relief Committee, ensuring the transportation, lodging, feeding, and cross-Atlantic return voyage for over 120,000 Americans. Hoover followed this success by leading the American Commission for Relief in Belgium. The purpose of the CRB was to import and organize the distribution of food for the densely packed Belgian population, and to avert the slaughter of civilians. The duties of the CRB later included feeding the populace of German-occupied France. With the U.S. entry into the war in 1917, President Wilson recognized the need for food management in America. He appointed Hoover head of the American Food Administration, which set minimum prices for certain commodities, such as wheat, to stabilize production. In early 1919, Herbert Hoover presided over the newly formed American Relief Administration. Funded by donation and staffed by volunteers, the ARA provided food and lodging to millions in war-torn Europe. In 1921, pleas for aid rang out from Bolshevik Russia. A drought-induced famine combined with the effects of a bloody civil war put the huge Russian populace in danger of starvation. Hoover led the relief effort. When asked if he was not thus helping Bolshevism, he retorted, 20 million people are starving. Whatever their politics, they will be fed. After the crisis had passed, Maxim Gorky, dubbed Russia's Mark Twain, wrote of his people's gratitude in a personal letter to Hoover. Your help will be inscribed in history as a unique, gigantic accomplishment, worthy of the greatest glory, and will long remain in the memory of millions of Russians, whom you saved from death. One year into the Russian relief effort, newly elected President Harding offered Hoover a choice between the posts of Secretary of Interior and Secretary of Commerce. Hoover chose Secretary of Commerce. Hoover's goals with the Department of Commerce were to help business run more efficiently and to regulate and promote new technologies. As Secretary of Commerce, he aided in the effort to secure an eight-hour workday. Hoover worked with labor leader Samuel Gompers and leading businessmen to negotiate between labor and business. Due to the aftereffects of World War I, the American economy slumped. Hoover convened the Unemployment Conference of 1921 to negate the effects of this recession. This crisis established the tactics that Hoover would later use to combat the effects of the Great Depression. Hoover believed that government and businesses should cooperate to relieve unemployment. These actions reflected his policy of volunteer cooperation, rather than what Hoover called enforced collectivism. Hoover could often accomplish more with the conference than with the reams of regulation. Hoover also used the Department of Commerce to aid foreign economies so that they could repay American loans and provide markets for American goods. These actions demonstrated Hoover's long-standing belief that self-interest and altruism could thrive hand in hand. For I have no fear that knowing our nation, we shall not be able to impress every country with the single-minded goodwill which lies in the American heart. The Mississippi flood of 1927 is known as the greatest river flood in American history. The governors of the affected states specifically requested Herbert Hoover to deal with this emergency. His first order of business was taking care of some 700,000 refugees displaced by the flood. Employing his influence and authority with both the public and private sectors, Hoover organized funds and donations to restore homes to those displaced and to rebuild the local economies. 
Hoover's record of triumphs made him a hero in the eyes and hearts of the American people, earning him the title Master of Emergencies. He easily wrote his resume of impressive successes into the office of president by a 58% majority vote in 1928. Hoover's presidency began with the hopes of many reforms. He advocated children's rights. He set aside 3 million acres of national parkland and 2.3 million acres of national forest and canceled oil leases on government land. He doubled the number of veterans' hospitals and began construction on what came to be known as the Hoover Dam. The infamous Black Thursday, the name given to the stock market crash on October 24, 1929, occurred less than eight months into Hoover's first year in office. His reaction to the crisis was swift. In the space of five days, in November 1929, he met with leaders from business and finance, railroads, public utilities, the construction industry, agriculture, labor, and with the Federal Reserve. He convened the Conference for Continued Industrial Progress and outlined four essential understandings. No strikes, no reduction in wages until the cost of living fell, a sharing of the burden whenever feasible, and employer responsibility for the relief of their employees. This voluntary arrangement gained the support of leaders of industry, including Henry Ford and Pierre Dupont, as well as the endorsement of William Green of the AFL for managing to sustain wages. Hoover contacted all 48 state governors, appealing to them to expand public works. He also went to Congress with a $160 million tax cut, coupled with the doubling of resources for public buildings and dams, highways and harbors, and appointed a federal farm board to try to raise farm prices. In the spring of 1930, the New York Times praised Hoover, stating that no one in his place could have done more, and very few of his predecessors could have done as much. The world economy plunged soon after this ringing proclamation. Combined with a severe drought causing what came to be known as the Dust Bowl, these two events halted the gradual recovery of the American economy and flung the U.S. into the depths of the Great Depression. Hoover's policies reflected his belief and experience in volunteerism. His humanitarian triumphs were all achieved by volunteer organizations. He saw coercion as damaging to the moral fiber of people. This exemplifies his Quaker morality. In 1929, he said, Every time the government is forced to act, we lose something in self-reliance, character, and initiative. Hoover's quiet courage and humility was both his greatest strength and greatest weakness. He calmly and thoroughly dealt with any problem presented, seeking no accolades. He was a genius at managing emergencies, feeding the starving, aiding the sick. However, in the Depression, Americans did not want a quiet, confident engineer. They wanted a confident voice, comforting them and telling them all would be well. Hoover lacked the ability to relate to the common man. This contributed to his tragic downfall. The Bonus Army may have been the last nail in Hoover's political coffin. 20,000 veterans marched on Washington to demand the early payment of their service bonuses. They were dispersed by the U.S. Army. Two civilians died and hundreds were injured in this conflict. America blamed Hoover. America was looking for something, someone, to blame for terrible and confusing times. President Hoover was the inevitable target, especially in the presidential contest of 1932. The Democrats attacked Hoover turning his silence, his lack of oratory ability, and his cold analytical manner against him. Hoover was not adept at playing Washington's political game. He simply did not know how to respond to these attacks. His own party abandoned him, and the American people found in him someone to blame. After entering the White House as a master of emergencies, Hoover left it as a casualty of the time. Hoover did not fade from history with a whimper. He continued his good works in the role of elder statesman, advising later presidents and continuing his legacy of humanitarian labors during and after the Second World War. A quiet man, Hoover had the wit and wisdom to wryly sum up his opponent's criticism. Once upon a time, my political opponents favored me as possessing the fabulous intellectual and economic power by which I created a worldwide depression all by myself. Herbert Hoover's life began as a blacksmith's son in the small Quaker town of West Branch, Iowa, an orphan with no special distinction or privilege. He rose to be one of the greatest men of the 20th century. In Europe and Asia, he saved more people from starvation than Hitler and Stalin together would murder. Yet he drove to his final campaign appearance in 1932 through crowds of angry New Yorkers shouting, We want bread. Hoover entered the office of the President of the United States as an American hero and left it as one of the greatest scapegoats in history.